Well, hey everybody, welcome again to the production channel. Uh, this is the place where we get to talk with uh, everyone in the industry, lighting, audio, video, show callers and everything. Um, and so, just really excited about today, but before I get into that, Clem, welcome, my boy. Yo, doing, yo, buddy? yo, greetings, man. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, dude? You been traveling a lot? What you, what you been doing? Lately? Oh, man, I've just been, um, I just came from a show... You know, home for a while. You know, I like that home, that work life balance. I've been home for about a week, week and a half, just getting back nice. into daddy mode, preparing for another show, and just go back out to yeah. AV camp and do it all over again. That's cool, man. Well, uh, again, I'm really excited about today. It's all about show callers, but uh, real quick before we get into that, Clem, for anyone who's new to the production channel or who's like going, what in the world is this? Uh, give our friends a background on what it is we're doing here. Well, hopefully they've been listening. You know, we've we've already right. had some episodes out. So for the, all the yeah. new the new listeners, the production channel mm-hmm. is an opportunity for us as technicians, as people in the industry, um, maybe shoot even somebody outside of the industry, maybe a spouse, a friend, a partner who just wants to understand more about our lifestyles on the road with our road family, our friends, the experiences that we had, what how we got into this business, where we want to go with our careers, where we want the industry to go. All those are type of things that we're going to just dive into with this series, this podcast series of the production channel. That's it, man. And honestly, we try to frame and format this thing in a way to where um, it's something you can listen to on a travel day, right? Yep. When you're sitting there on your Delta flight with your status and you got your upgrade, you're super excited, your three Jack and Cokes in. Or you're delayed at an airport. <laughs> or you're delayed or literally the most worst opposite scenario of that, yes. Um, either way, there's a place for production channel. Um, well, cool. Let's get into it today. Uh, today I'm joined uh, by John Allen. Welcome, John. Morning, gents. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> um. So a little background on John. John is really a professional uh, show director and caller, also um, technical director, owner of Technical Designs. The cool thing about John is his background is really uh, ranges from theater to concerts, uh, and really now uh, is a is a is a leader in the corporate events uh, and show directing space. So, um, anyways, that said, I just want to kind of uh, say again, welcome John. John's a good friend of show flows. Uh, we've really been working with him over the last couple months and year, uh, just in figuring out the best way to bring change into the industry. And that, and just after experiencing some time with John, knowing that, uh, that's a real passion for him, uh, that just really made sense to get him on today's call. So again, welcome John. Um, I guess to kick us off, dude, as we like to ask everybody, how in the heck did you get to where you are? You're you're at the front of house calling massive, massive shows in stadiums and in massive ballrooms. Uh, how in the world did you get there? Where did you get started? You know, man, it's, uh, this podcast is such good timing because just yesterday, the director of the little community theater, I was 10 years old in Northern California when I started acting and uh, and I kept in touch with this cat, Cliff Byer, and he came over yesterday to my house and met my kid. He's 70 years old now. And like, it really gave us a chance to talk about how theater and, and that beginning kind of has run like a thread through our lives for sure. Mm. Uh, yeah. So I started acting when I was a little kid and then started doing lighting, you know, with like, man. Like building little rheostats and stuff and doing that's cool punk bands around the Bay Area and uh, doing the high school theater scene. I was still kind of performing and doing lights, doing all the technical stuff. And then I went away to college thinking I was going to step away and, uh, you know, do do another thing. I was going to teach, actually. But um, I ended up connecting back with Arden Fingerhut, who's an old school lighting designer, Broadway, that some people will remember. She was amazing and uh she showed me everything that i that i didn't know and Mm. started putting me on a path towards a more holistic way of Mm. thinking about design uh and then i started doing rock and roll and rigging i was was a climber growing up uh so rigging seemed like a great way to make good money not work too hard and 
see the world, you know. So I toured doing that and then um, slid into corporate, man. I, I wish I could even tell you how that happened. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how you go from punk to corporate. That one's, that one's a pretty good jump. Only in America. <laughs> Only in America. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Did you have long hair when you were in the punk oh, band scene? Man, after high school, yeah, I had hair down to my waist. It was crazy. Oh, <laughs> not, for, not so for much. Good right money. I, I will send those pictures around for good money. Yeah, Clem, oh, Clem and Steven know me. For right now, there's no hair. No hair. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was the thing, man. I, uh, corporate makes a lot of sense for people, you know, especially for freelancers. You know, like uh, Clem mentioned, I think, which really resonated with me, you know, coming back and getting off the road and switching over to daddy time. I do the same thing. I'm a single mm. dad and I've got a 15 year old daughter. And uh, that flexibility that we have with our schedule, you know, on the surface of it, a lot of people look at us and think that you travel all the time and it must be really hard. And it, and it is, it is. But there's also upsides to it because when you're home, you know, you're home 24 7, 100 percent attention on your kids mm -hmm. and it can make a it's a different style of parenting but it can make uh for a really sweet experience too i think i, I don't think it's something to shy away from i know guys that you know that hit our income level in the so-called real world and they see their kids you know after seven o'clock at night after dinner for an hour hour and a half they might right. see them for one day on the weekend it's all really rush 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 they're always distracted uh, mm -hmm. because their job is encroaching constantly. So I, for me personally, whether I was wired this way to begin with or whether being in the business for, you know, shoot, dude, it's uh, 39 years now, uh, wow. has pushed me this way. Like, I don't know which came first, but for me, even with all the self-doubts that you have as a parent, it works pretty well. Yeah. yeah. I know one so. thing, one of the struggles that I've had, <clears throat> you know, coming out of uh, out of college and and finding my way into uh, sports broadcasting. I was a camera operator for the Magic, Orlando Magic for 15 seasons. Orlando Magic. Yeah. I was there last night, watched them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then found my way into this industry and that grind and that run and go chase that dollar and all that. And, uh -huh. you know, it, it just be, it consumed me. And sure. it finally took my my wife and the family dynamic and all of that for me to realize that, you know, you're 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 focusing on the wrong things. You're missing right. what's important out of life, chasing that dollar or chasing the 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 mindset of I have to work now because I don't know if I'm going to have a you know if when the next gig is going to come in. But I've mm -hmm. been I've been fortunate enough and blessed to have those gigs always come in. But I'm still chasing. So absolutely, man. I know you it had never mentioned goes away, right? earlier. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. But all that. But I'm trying to change my mindset. And um, what made me think about all of that is how you were talking about the family time, but then you were also talking about somebody that taught you the holistic point of view, and like the holistic point of view of lighting. But what about the holistic point of view of the industry? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, I agree, man. It's uh, and it's funny because I, I I think Stephen has seen this, but I have my uh, I have this list going of I don't know. It's probably like twenty five ways of to be a better show caller, right? That mm -hmm. I kind of use when I'm talking to people getting in the business, and I pass it around amongst friends. There's some funny stuff in there, but there's some you know I kicked it to a producer last week on a gig, and what he wrote back was, "Wow, that's a really holistic view of what we do," and I'm like. Right. And I hadn't really thought about it that way before, but it's true. You affect people in many, many more ways than just what we're dealing with to get that cue done. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as we've seen, you know, in the last month, I know of two cats in our industry who unfortunately decided to, to take their lives. And, I'm, mm -hmm. and there's probably more out there that I haven't heard of, but two people that I knew. And it, and it happens in our business. And, um, I think it's worth taking them second and just remembering that even if you're just touching somebody on headset, just seeing them on a show, just seeing them backstage for a second, maybe you get to catch a meal. Although that's pr pretty rare for me to be able to do, but you know, maybe you can sit and talk. It's, I like to get deep fast with people and mm, it's, I get and it's, that. it's worthwhile, man. Like you get more than you ever give 
if you sit and talk with people. And it took me a really long time to learn that, man. I was kind of an awkward, shy kid growing up. And when I got in the business, I was hyper-focused on what I was doing because I wanted to be really good at it. Yeah. And it probably delayed my development as a person, you know, moved my development in the business, but it delayed my development as a, as a whole person longer than it should have. And that's part of what I try to teach people that are coming up. You know, they don't have to focus, like you were saying, you know, you don't have to focus so much on chasing the dollar. Yeah. It's, now, when, we're fortunate, though. We're fortunate because right. we've got the opportunities and we're making money. And that's not true for a lot of people. So. Yeah, we put our mm-hmm. we put our time in, and we've allowed ourselves to. I, I feel like if you're true to yourself, if you if you're a good person, that will shine out. And if you care about what you want to do and be good at what you want to do, then Agreed. the opportunities, the work will come. The opportunities will come. Now, from a show point of view, like as a caller, as a um, stage manager, how do you? Because obviously, you know, they get stressful. The environments get stressful. The producers, yeah. I mean, not the producers, but sometimes, yeah, producers too. They get on edge. The client, they get on edge. How do you stop that stress from coming down to the rest of the people on headset? Yeah, it's, uh, that's important to me. And it's, um, I think of it like, a, like an hourglass, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm the neck of the hourglass. So all sorts of craziness can be happening upstream of me. And, and my job is to make sure that it doesn't affect the, sh- the crew's f- functioning. Like not only their personal reactions, but also, you know, selfishly, I want this show to go well. I want a guy to execute. I want 100%, you know, 110% effort from everybody. And the right way to get that isn't by berating people. It's not by overreacting. It's not by passing along stress. It's by making sure the crew knows that you've got their back and that you're going to set them up mm-hmm. for success. You're going to give them the information they need. They're never going to wonder what they're about to do. And when the, you know, when the situations get crazy and stuff fails, that you have a path out, right? Like you mm-hmm. are not looking to them to solve this for you. And that's really important to me. So I, and I have, I have, I don't have these clients anymore, but, you know, I, I've had clients who prefer a different style of management, who who don't feel like a uh, stage manager is doing their job unless they're yelling at the crew constantly, uh, that they've got to squeeze the crew. I've had creative directors like that big. There's a big creative director. I won't mention his name. Stephen's heard me complain about him before. He's known far <laughs> and wide as kind of a stereotypical, horrible you know, throw stuff, berate people personally, kind of a guy. And, and he and I've had conversations about this management style. And I just, I, not only do I, do I not believe it's effective, I also cannot live in that world. I won't yeah. contribute to that world. So, yeah, I, uh, I use a lot of humor. I uh, tend to swear a lot on headset. I, uh... <laughs> you do. But you're doing very good right now, John. You're doing very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm really trying hard. Get a cookie. <laughs> Get a BFC. <laughs> yeah, you know, like we try to keep it casual until it until it's not right. Like as long as yeah. things are flowing, it's. I don't require a sterile intercom environment. I mean, it's it's certainly not crazy, but you know, I'm. Who are we to pretend that this isn't our lives, right? Like yeah, yeah. we're on headset. That's it. It's well, twelve and, hours a day. And, you know, I think John with. Uh, the interesting thing with your role and your responsibility, particularly, again, focusing in as the show caller, but, well, actually, even as a technical director, but still keep it on show caller. Um, you are the bottleneck between the sort of chaos above production and, and your show crew and, and the crew in terms of when we're on headset and when we're in rehearsals. Um, we're all listening to you. You are the beat, right? The drum beat right there for the entire thing. And so if you respond uh, to that pressure above you uh, and let it affect you, we feel that oh, and yeah. we hear that because literally we've got you in our ears. I, I don't think that a lot of people outside of our industry even really understand that. I, I, I find it um, – it's a cool thing when I walk into even an arena, uh, maybe it's a big show, it's a big conference, whatever it is, and maybe you're in walk-in and I'm sitting there thinking what I hear right now, like as a member in the audience or whatever, 
is one thing, but there's like this second universe of conversation <laughs> going on, right? Like it's almost like you could play off of the spiritual world versus the physical world. It's like right. there's this entire other public channel of conversation going on that someone is either like working out logistics or they're uh, bashing somebody on the stage. And I'm like, I want to be on it. I want to know right, what's going right. on. Yeah, I'm a horrible audience I know. Member, it's, <laughs> but I think that like that's a cool thing and the idea that it's it's likely 80%, if not more, one person's voice in 36 people's ears, you know, or even more. Uh, and that that role res- falls on you. It's just, it's just not a small thing. So um, if you didn't realize that, you have a lot of pressure. So side note, Tim, there you go. <laughs> um, and, and then I guess just more, have, how much have you thought about that in terms of, for me, and I'm sure Clem can relate to this as a video director, I can sense when you have control and when you don't. Oh yeah, you know. Uh, oh, when you're I focused, can feel that and, and I hear that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I can also tell when you're taking care of us and when you're taking care of yourself. That's right. Um, no. And so yeah, talk to us about that. Like, what goes through your head on all that? It's stuff? a huge responsibility, man. And I actually, I'm wired to think about best practices in everything that I do. Um, you know, all my weird hobbies and all the stuff you know, in my normal life and certainly at work. Right. And so I, I think about best practices and, and I'm not going to say I'm a hundred percent, um, all the time. I, you know, of course not. I fail always. And you have to have compassion for yourself. Number one, which, you know, also you have to have compassion for other people failing and knowing, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to trust that everybody wants to do a good job. That's, that's the most important thing that I feel like. And, and in those few mo- times, right, when we've all run into it, when you really run across somebody who is weighing over their heads and won't admit it, like won't ask for help, <laughs> or is just massively, like, is just one of those personalities that is not going to be able to perform, then you have to have enough production chops to to figure out when you're going to let somebody go and, and replace them. Because yeah. the number one thing is, you know, the show's got to happen. Right. And Mm -hmm. while you want to be as kind as possible in our processes, you can never let that take over. I mean, I was laughing. uh, I have a good friend who's a a lighting designer and he used to tease me. He's like, hey, man, uh, you're kind of like Jekyll and Hyde here. You know, you're really cool. And then suddenly something snaps. And and my uh, my kid is super funny. She'll say to her friends, you know, she's like, yeah, my dad's cool until he's not. And and initially, like the first time I heard it, I was sort of bugged by it. But then I realized that that's actually, I actually believe in that. I should be really cool in the production process. And then when someone isn't giving me what I need, isn't cool to me back, like isn't performing, I don't understand why I should continue to be cool about it. Like you should get what you give in this world. And I Mm want to always give the best I can. And I hope that other people can. I don't necessarily always expect it, but I hope it happens. And that feedback loop of reinforcement is just a really sweet thing, man, when it happens. And the great thing about our business is it's all in the service of telling a story, right? Like that's how I talk about Colin shows. We're telling a story for the audience. And that's what's so beautiful when we can craft a moment and it's, Right, it's me grasping at existential straws, kind of, because, you know, let's face it, for a lot of what we do, you know, there's not a lot of story there. There's the client's story that we're telling, but we're not crafting high art with what we do. But we can craft a moment within a long day of grind that we can all feel good about, right? When that, you know, when that music dives and the lights drop out and when, you know, you just take this little moment where you feel that breath intake out of the audience and then you drop into uh, that opening video and you feel that volume kick (laughs) and you watch the audience lean forward. And I mean, that's really like the sweet moments that are still out there to be taken if you're willing to to concentrate on the details. That's what's important. I, I've got to say something as you as you're describing this because you and I worked together on um, a Microsoft show at the uh, Orlando Co- Convention Center, Lor- Orange County Convention Center. Yeah, and we ha- we were in a round. The stage was in the middle, and we were in the round, and then there was a screen, a perforated uh, 
um, yeah, a little drop down. I really want to call it a screen. Yeah, scrim. There you go. That yeah. and there were people dancing inside, and Microsoft was telling the story of their history on the video in the middle, and then the screens. You know, they used the round to kind of support that. Now, as a projectionist, and and, St- and uh, Stephen, you'll you'll kind of understand this a little bit too. But as a projectionist, I give so much in trying to. I, I tell my story through the screens. But the, everybody sees the screens, and I want my screens to be perfect, converge perfectly, colors to match perfectly all the way across, because I understand this is what people are going to see. Now, right. I give so much into that, but then I have to go backstage, and I miss the opening number. So you're describing right. that opening moment, right? And fortunately for that show, I didn't have a true... um position like dur- during the show so i was actually able to see the opening oh, cool. number and i saw how beautiful and impactful it was but there's so many times that people behind backstage don't see that so they right. get mm. lost or not lost but they don't have a, the opportunity to feel what you just described yeah they and don't it's get the different payoff. Yeah. yeah no because they're all because the payoff only happens when everybody backstage is so focused on their piece of it and that's yeah. that's what i you know i grew up doing all those positions right i was graphics at tvl for god's sake i was <laughs> camera op, camera director audio lighting you know i had the i i think that it makes me a much better show caller than i would ever be otherwise i'm not saying it's the only path towards being a good show director but for me it helps me to know you know, and I can't keep up, obviously, with all the latest technology, but it <laughs> yeah. helps me to know what pe- what other people are going through so that I can guide the process more effectively. And so um, when I'm, you know, I, I feel like what you're saying, everybody's got to be focused on their thing. But my, the, like, the sweet spot for me, what I love about it is if I've got the right crew, I don't, I don't have to worry about any of that. I l- literally say words and crazy shit happens. It's the best <laughs> job in the world. <laughs> like, it's um, how, how very Genesis of you. <laughs> Dude, he spoke. And, it and I only did amazing. it in four days. I only did it in four days. <laughs> yeah. Oh, John. Oh. Man, can I, can I tell you a really fast story about that? It's, yeah, it's, man. I was doing a really heavy show, and uh, for some goofy reason, they'd put the translation booths on the same level as control. I was up about 15 feet. Right behind me, right? So all these glass windows, and they're not far behind me. I've got maybe like five feet of space. And I have a a really horrible tendency on big shows for big moments to stand and and wave my arms around, right? I look really stupid. But I conduct (laughs) shit. So these (laughs) these little ladies in the translation booth were coming out at the first break, and they were laughing, and we're talking, you know? and, And they're like, it's so funny because... You point at a screen and the screen changes. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and and then they start giving me a hard time because I, you know, I dance a little bit as I'm calling these shows, right? When there's heavy music going on. So I'm like, can you guys just not look up anymore? I don't want to be the It's bad, bad news. <laughs> but yeah, it's that's cool. how it's like that's awesome. how it feels. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. That sounds cool. It sounds beautiful. I, and, you know, I, there's been moments, there's been opening numbers where I've been able to, to be a part of it. And, you know, people, people who know me, I'm an emotional guy, okay? And I'm, I have no problem admitting it. Yes, yes. I'm 6'7", I'm tall, <laughs> I'm black, you know, I've got the bald head. And, yes, you may find me in the corner shedding a tear because it's so beautiful, you know? Oh, That's good <laughs> stuff, brother. That's good stuff. You know what's interesting is uh... – I think that so being a you know live video director for particularly corporate events for so long, um, I'm always backstage. And honestly, the bigger the show, even the further away I am from it, you know, I mean, the bigger the show, I'm either in a, you know, in the tunnel in the MGM Grand somewhere mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, very very far removed. And uh, I've thought about this, and I've talked with people about this before. I think that it it ha- there's a benefit, like there's a there's a pro and a con to that. The pro is I have a clear disconnect from the actual like 
largeness of what it feels like to be in the room during big moments. So for example, like I do these really, really big shows with Jury Design. I've been doing them for years. Uh, and they're all about the, you know, they do these IBM shows and they, they you know, it's all about the big opener. Um, and so, you know, we'll rehearse it for three days straight and it's necessary because, you know, they're beautiful, beautiful openings. But at the end of the day, for me, the difference between a rehearsal and the show is very different in terms of personal pressure backstage because I've just been experiencing the entire thing through a four inch <laughs> virtual window video, you know, right. tile on a multi view that I'm looking at. So my sense of that room being filled with 16,000 people this time versus last time, I don't, I don't get it because I'm so removed from mm. it. Um, I never thought about and, that. Yeah, man. That yeah. And I, I think I do, I think it plays to my advantage, but it also, uh, Anyone who knows why, one of the big reasons I even, you know, sort of have chosen a different route with this industry, moving into more of this this vendor provider with show, show flow, is because I got burnt out uh, of it. And it's because I didn't care. My passion wasn't there. It isn't because I didn't care. I mean, I loved what I did, but it was just more of like, there. I didn't feel close to my work. Um, it was you know, a art and, you know, people like John Allen and other, you know, show callers, you guys want live video directors that way when you call imag you don't have to call every oh, yeah. individual cut inside of that call no. you call imag and what you're really saying is stevie do your thing no, i'm like yeah I'm, I'm, I'm your assistant director man like i'll remind you right. where people are coming from and what's coming up if you haven't had a chance to make notes right. but yeah i need you I, absolutely and and i think that like that that i measured as an art uh for me um but, you know, I, I guess all that to say, when I did, so I did some touring with some bands and I got to go out with uh, LMG's tour with Rune 5 and Train. And so for those shows, I'm calling cameras and it's all in shed tour, right? It's all amphitheaters. And I'm on the stage, right. uh, what my video switching console or whatever. And so for me, right there, I just look to my right and I see 16,000 people. And as you got more into the night and the lights are going on. And so there are these moments where if I took a, a live shot of the audience, I could like turn to the right and feel yeah. the audience light up with energy and excitement. And then as I take it away, I could see them like long for more, right. you know. And so uh, there's something to be said about your role there, John, being out in the driver's seat Um that is a special thing that I don't think most people get to see. Honestly, it's usually just the show caller, the producer, the A1, and the LD. You guys are like the only ones. No, man, you, experience you just that. gave me another reason to be grateful. Thanks, dude. Yeah. <laughs> now, now speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of being grateful, art, and shining light on something, and light, you know, lighting joy, mm -hmm. what outside of work gives you that? What do you look forward to going home to? Oh, Shit, man, me. Uh, I mean, honestly, <laughs> it's it's my kid. She's she's rad. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if, cool. if you ever end up on headset, uh, like people have to suffer through. I try to be cool about it because uh, I know how boring it can get to listen to people talk about their kid. But yeah, my my kid. I mean, it's just been she and I uh, for the most part. You know, with with some other personalities thrown in over the years, but. Um, I've been divorced from her mom for a long time and, and so my kid and I are, are close and, you know, I always, uh, you know, she's 15 and, you know, I always figure like, oh, this, this hug before bedtime, this will be the last time, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm always grateful for the next one, but, uh, yeah, I get to hang with a pretty cool, like, She's a classical violinist. She writes and performs slam poetry. Nice. Uh, we dye her hair a different color every month. And uh, I'm just teaching her how to drive right now, an old old manual Land Rover. And, uh, nice. Uh, yeah, she's, she's cool. Uh, but, you know, you can't, like the other thing is you can't focus, like your kid has to have room, right? Your kid has to, mm -hmm. to breathe. So uh, I come home and... Uh, I, uh, I've been a pilot for a long, long time, so I, uh, I try to get out flying. I love that. That's so Wait, cool. a pilot? Uh, you said pilot? Yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I just, I've been pilot for 20 years, but I just started gliding too, which uh, you guys actually down there have this amazing glider port uh, about 30 minutes away from Orlando. Uh, oh, wow. Really? Yeah, then I'm going to check out this, this winter. I went and looked on that Microsoft show when we had that early day. I went and checked it out, and it was pretty cool. 
Um, mm. So there's a lot of, I have a lot of, you know, weird hobbies like that. I, I work on vehicles. I get an old motorcycle. I, uh, I just started learning how to fly fish. I mean, I, I keep my days pretty busy. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I, I also work. My shift in the last two years has been to really work half time when I do work, like sort of do a uh, week on week off when I can arrange it that way. And I take the summers off. I, I do one one show a month in the summers uh, when Liz is out of school. And then I, I tend to take most of December off. You know, it's pretty easy because our business is a little bit slow. I might have rehearsals for CES or something, but um, or for something in January. I mean, that's that's the reason I kind of keep my hand in doing other stuff and still TDing and drawing shows is because I like to be able to make a little a little change when I'm not on the road, you know. Right. It's kind of right. nice. Yeah. Now you you mentioned something when we, before we started recording about an opportunity that you had to uh, to teach. Like how oh, how, yeah. how do you kind of take that passion that you have and place it on somebody else's heart. Oh, that's a load, brother. Um, <laughs> hey, man, you yeah. said you like to get deep, man. Come yeah, on. I'm I mean, that's right. <laughs> I'm Dr. Deep. Let It Flow right here, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, I've, uh, I've always taught one way or the other, you know, whether it was uh, an activity, a sport, uh, you know, climbing or sailing uh i've always you know taught here and there and and because of the best practices philosophy you know i'm always listening to people who do stuff better than i do or do stuff differently than i do and making sure that i integrate um that into what i'm doing right because Ex- explain the explain the best practices for people who don't know explain that well like what's the what's like in any given situation i mean people often say oh there's a you know i don't like to say that skin the cat thing because i don't that's kind of cruel but like there's a there's a hundred ways to do something you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. uh, people say that and and while i believe in everybody's right to do everything the way they want to do it and everybody's got a different style i think that there's a certainly for production um Mm -hmm. and this is you know true in my flying true in sailing to a certain extent like there's a once you know a lot about something and can consider everything like once you have data you can figure out the best path i wish you guys could see me right now because my hands are going crazy (laughs) like you can figure out the the right way like a way that's that's even if it's slightly more effective like if it's slightly better if it's slightly kinder if it's you know whatever it is you can figure out a way that's slightly better and that's best practices man like you Mm -hmm. you can do things in a way, once you think about it, you don't have to give in to the way you've always done something or the way you've always heard it be done. So like, for instance, really s- stupid things with show calling, like when I, when I do warnings, when I do setups for something, I always end on an, on an up note, right? You know, uh, uh, Radio Lights 121, Audio 2, and Switch 13. And I, and I mm. wait there, I sit mm. there. I because everybody yeah. listens, you know, and then you take that pause and nobody's going to do anything else until you say go. Yeah. And and like little tiny things, even with paperwork, you know, I believe firmly that there's there's and that's why I, I got so involved with Showflow and Steven and Brian and you guys, because like I love the flexibility with your with your your system, because I can arrange that in a way that lets everybody make it be their best practices. It lets them see their data in the right way for them. And that, I think, is really helpful because we live in such a data-dense production world. So uh, for, for me, best practices is, is about that. So uh, you were talking about the teaching thing. What was crazy last week is I ended up on a show where, and I don't, I, you know, you talk about big shows. I do, I'm happy to do small shows. Like, I don't, <laughs> I'm past that ego deal where you want to only do the biggest best blah 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 I've, I've done most of that i mean you know if somebody wants to call me out to do the olympics maybe if it's not in rio but somewhere else shoot, of course <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know like uh for most of what we do big or small like i actually charge the same so it doesn't really matter to me at the end yeah, of the day right right it's more fun to have some meat on the bone i get it but mm-hmm. um i don't like being bored 
So I took this gig last week, and in my head it was, this is a show that's going in the college fund, right? Like, this is why we, work is called work for me. Mm. And uh, nobody's going to pay me to stay at home. I'm going to take this gig. And it was, it was with a brand new crew of people I really didn't know many people on at all. I knew a few. And I was doing a uh, like a 4,000-person offshoot broadcast. Like, we throw back and forth. We had some hosts on our stage, but we were really not doing a ton. And during the day when I was listening in, uh, you know, remotely on the uh, general session rehearsals, so I knew what was going to be happening for the next day, my room turned into a breakout room, right? So the, uh, we had another, one of my deck managers decided that she was cool calling uh, the breakouts and all for it. So what I, but she didn't have a lot of experience. So what I got to do, which was so amazing, is uh, two things happened last week that were beautiful. One is... I got to listen to another person do what I do for a heavy mm-hmm. show. So I'm listening in to that caller, work with that crew. I'm on an ISO to them. Like we can bullshit around and talk about what's happening and make sure everything is cool between us, you know. But I'm also hearing all of his stuff go down with producer upstream and the crew downstream. I can feel him. It's very rare that, that we get to do that. Uh, in our yeah. business, I don't often get to hang with other show callers. I'm not often on yeah, shows. With that's them, right. You know? And to be so intimate with them in a way that um, I, and he's heard me call other shows in the past. And like, I hear things he says that are exactly how I say it and, you know, and vice versa. You know what I mean? Like, that's a really mm-hmm. nice synergy. Mm-hmm. So that was really cool for me. And I, and I made sure to uh, acknowledge it in the moment, to say something to him about it and to say something to myself about being grateful because I went into the show thinking it was going to kind of be a crappy week. I'm in in it for the money, but you know, now like I get this thing and then it, it, it helps reset you. Right. And so then I have this, uh, woman who's going to call the breakouts and I'm able to guide her through making her cue sheets. I'm able to listen to her call rehearsals and give her feedback about, things that are not working things that are working you know like massage that process watch her take that input watch her make changes and and see her start to self-educate right which is what every yeah. that's what you want with everybody you want to give them the mm-hmm. tools to self-educate so then i watched her build on what we had talked about and re- like start to blossom and about two days in the uh a1 hit me up on iso after she had done a call and then a quick vo and it dumped us into the start of the show and you know like it's not a lot but it's a lot when you've never done it before you know she had confided Mm -hmm. in me that the night before the first show she had anxiety sweaty palms was really nervous and then we get two days later and say one lights me up and he's like man like she has come a long way two days ago that would like that would not have happened and that sounded you know that was perfect and like i know it's <laughs> to watch someone do that it was amazing and yeah. uh and we never get to like teaching i have friends who teach stage management uh, there's a lot of graduate level uh programs out there and my understanding is they mostly teach broadway style theater stage management um, not really what we do or although they'll do a seminar about what we do or a module on corporate show calling um and i'm and i you know i'm supposed to get in there and and teach uh with her and this is at uc san diego uh i think you know lisa porter steven um and she's oh, awesome yeah. you know and she teaches a great program and she's very holistic about all of this but uh i think a lot of those programs you know we're a minor I mean, this genre of corporate stuff that we do is is everything to us, but not a lot mm-hmm. of other people know about it, so they don't get taught it, which is a bummer because in terms of bang for the buck, it's definitely the best way to be a stage manager, you know, yeah. uh, other than high, high-level television, you're not, which is more like camera directing. You're not going to find a lot better income out there. Like, you're not going to make what we make call it theater, unfortunately. Yeah. And in my experience, maybe I'm wrong. Somebody can call me up and tell me I'm wrong. But... Um, I think that like often you teach, but you don't get to watch somebody do it at the same time. Like you teach and you say, okay, go do your thing. And then tell me how it felt afterwards. But to really be mm-hmm. a part of that process in the moment was a huge gift too, man. Definitely. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and as, as you're saying all of that, it makes me think so much about, um, uh, program 
a series or whatever that I've kind of started where, yeah, I'm a projectionist and I've come up with a curriculum, as if you will, of uh, teaching projection. Nice. And it's called it's called Projection 101, you know, just th- down to the basics. Like, we're going all the way back. I don't want any geometry in there. We're just talking about, I mean, excuse me, I don't want any, um, when I say geometry, like warping. I don't want any warping right. in there, just basic stuff. But in that, before we even get to touching the projectors, the whole first part about it, of the of the, the seminar or the workshop, is about the theory of projection and changing that mm-hmm. mindset from going from a stage hand or going from a projection assist into the projectionist mindset and, and understanding, taking ownership of mm-hmm. what you're doing, understanding the art of it, understanding that, you know, one thing I like to say you know, is, is every pixel matters. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, like when you're uh, doing yeah. that overlap, every pixel matters. Now, on the other side of that, it's also talking about, for me, when I say every pixel matters, you mentioned this before, that relationship that you establish with people on the crew. If you think of each person on the crew as a pixel, every single pixel matters. That's so right, what man. are you doing to shape that pixel, to help that pixel to to mean something, to to stand out and to to long to last, to have that long, long lasting career in this industry? Or if it's not meant to last, how would they transition into something else, but always remember that moment that you had with them? Oh, yeah. You know, it's like life oh, projection for me. It's so, it's so much more, man. Well, and, and I want to just say, like, it's, it's two ways, right? Like, those guys are giving something back to me, too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a top-down thing. And a lot of people mistake um, show callers as... You know, it, it can come across as a very arrogant position, and mm. and I and I want people to and the people that know me like it's important to me that they understand that um, I never think of it that way. I actually think of it as I'm in service, right? Like I have told I, I've I've told people what the expectation is. I've given them the tools and the time. And the feedback from front of house, you know, deciphering what the producer wants, the client wants. Like I'm telling their story. It's not my story. I'm telling somebody else's story and I'm, and I'm getting everybody on the crew to, to get there. But um, I'm just like, I'm the voice of timing out front. And if I abdicate that and let other, let people be, like take their own timing. I mean, and obviously like, you know, in moments for sure. Like I always say like, you don't have to do what I say, but I'm never going to get mad at you if you do. But if you're not going to do what I say, don't be wrong. (laughs) Like, you know, just Mm -hmm. be right. Cause I'm going to get distracted with the client. I'm going to, you know, screw up. I'm a human being. I'm going to fail, but you know, cover me. I'll thank you publicly. Like it's really important to publicly thank someone when they, when they bail you out. I will, you know, buy you a beer that night, what, you know, whatever. But I don't expect people to do my job for me because I think that's wrong. I'm being paid good money to to do a job and to sit there and let other people, you know, take cues on their own. They don't really know. They're backstage. They they don't know what, what how they're integrated with stuff. I think that that's not that's that's me kind of uh screwing up the whole process man you know like that's not me being the, the a good person for that crew so i'm i i hope like when i sit down and talk to guys like i'm not out there saying it's my way or the highway i'm the only person who knows what to do you guys just punch buttons it gets never like that in my head and it, i can understand it maybe getting interpreted that way in the heat of the moment because things have to get be said right it's one show one voice like I have to decide what's going to happen and I have to take that responsibility. But it's never because I think that other people can't do it. They just aren't being paid to do it that day. I am. Mm-hmm. So that's my hit on that. That's awesome. Knowledge drop. No, man. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, that's, that's, uh, that's huge. That's the perspective that well, – that's just an example of one of the perspectives that, we, that we're trying to get together here on this, on this sort of podcast. So – um, John, thank you, man. This was huge. I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, guys, man. It's a, it's a pleasure always to talk to you guys. Thanks, thanks for diving a little d- deep with me. 
That's awesome. All right. Well, uh, for everybody else, we're going to wrap this uh, episode. But again, stay tuned. to Keep tuning in. We're uh, going to keep bringing different people from the industry, whether it's broadcast, sports, camera, video, lights, audio. Um, we're going to bring them. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to interview them and bring them to you guys. So with that, Clem, I appreciate your brother. John, I appreciate you. And we'll catch you guys next week on the production channel. Chatter.